Um, we've got Stefan and Chris, who built the re-4091 SCSI board. Uh, freaking amazing. Uh, I'm sure it, it was very easy. It took you like <laughs> a weekend. Knew everything ahead of time. All documented on the internet. So, no. No, hard work, sweat, tears, and uh, a lot of love and passion. Um, what I'll do is I'll go to the board. You guys start talking. I'll make the levels. Just keep talking. I'll get the levels right. I'll make sure Robert's clean. Sounds and, good. And uh, we'll go from there. Green lights on both? Yep. All right. All right, folks. Um, Hi, and uh, welcome to our talk about our little update, the Emmy West update uh, of uh, the Re Amiga 4091, uh, which is a SCSI controller that Chris and I have built together over the last year. And this is uh, somewhat of an anniversary, actually. Um, we had the idea, more or less, to build this uh, project uh, one year ago over there at one of the tables. And we talked each other into it. <laughs> and one year later, we're here to present the update and how far we've gotten so far. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right on. So who are we? Right? We're two former engineers by trade, basically, that met in Silicon Valley um, and we during a pandemic. And we started building hardware together. We met online and started talking. Um, in, a, in a funny coincidence, and we found out that we actually live seven minutes apart from each other. So during the pandemic, we started dropping little hardware parts off at each other's house and saying, like, hey, do you still have that 7404? It's like, yeah, I have three left. Um, I'll bring them over this afternoon. Um, and so I've, in my day job, I work for Google. I work on Chrome OS. Um, I uh, I'm a BIOS guy. I work on Core Boot, open source firmware, um, and have done other projects, open source projects in my past. Like uh, I worked a little bit on UAE, the Amiga emulator. I did stuff like Open BIOS and a bunch of other things. And Chris, so Shevin and I have uh, similar backgrounds. We had never met each other before. What three years ago? Four years mm -hmm. ago? Something like that. Uh, it is green. However, uh, maybe it's not loud enough. Can you hear me now? No worries. So we have similar backgrounds. We're, we're both firmware developers, um, but we work for different companies at different points in time. So it was really a remarkable thing that we came together and uh, found we had uh, such similar interests as well. Um, my background, I, I started with the Amiga back in 1988. And uh, at the time, I was going into college. and. It was one of those purchases you do with all your summer money that you earned before you went off to school. Um, the Amiga was a love of mine right from the start. Just, I, I had previous Commodore experience with the 8-bit machines and such, and I really enjoyed those as well. But the, the Amiga hit a spot that the 8-bits did not for me. And uh, one of the projects I did while I was in college, we had access to Sun workstations there. I wanted to be able to take data from those Sun drives and use it on my Amiga. Well, it had a different file system. The Unix file system was uh, quite a bit different than the Amigas. So a buddy, in my, a buddy of mine and I, um, we decided to write a file system for the Amiga that could read and write Sun disks. And uh, that was the first major project that I did that I um, released back in the early 90s. Not source code at that time, just binary only, because that was the way at that time. Um, back in 2016, someone convinced me to go ahead and release the source code to it. And I took one look at the source code that I wrote back in the early 90s and decided, wow, I have matured a lot since then. <laughs> so uh, it took me about six months to actually make it to where I could consider it presentable. And I fixed a number of bugs along the way in code that no one will ever use again. But at least it's out there, and it's now fully open source. Um, so along that path of releasing that code, I, I discovered there was a community of active people developing Amiga. And turns out uh, I met Stefan through uh, uh, Paul Rezendez. Rezendez. How do you say his name? Rezendez. Rezendez. And uh, from there, we found 
all sorts of similar interests, and we were designing small boards uh, individually ourselves mm. that we both thought, oh, those are neat projects between us, and I think we just developed common interests from there. Mm. That's about all I'd like right to Right on. All right, I want to point out that uh, this presentation is running on an Amiga, so it takes about three seconds to switch the slides. But yay technology, this is awesome. Um, so what are we doing here, right? Uh, we decided to build a, a brand new Zorro 3 controller. Um, and um, the, the, the fun thing to know about this controller is there were actually only two Zorro 3 controllers ever built, uh, SCSI controllers ever built for the Amiga. One is the uh, 4091 and the other one is the Fastline Z3. And the Fastlane Z3 is a completely closed design and it's hard to reproduce. You can't get the chips, you can't get the logic that goes into it. Um, it's very different with a 4091. So 4091, it's like a, a full-size card. It's a pretty big, large card. It does a uh, fast SCSI 2, so 10 megabytes per second. Um, it, uh, it's designed for the Amiga 4000 specifically and it's one of those projects that um, I heard Dave uh, Haney say he built it so that they let him do the 4000. Um, and um, because of that, it also needs the Buster 11 chip um, for uh, DMA capabilities. Um, it's based on the NCR 710 chip that's pretty common at the time um, and supports both x86 and uh, 68K architectures. Um, and it does auto boot, um, which back in the day was the special thing. Um, yeah, how did it start? Uh, uh, Chris mentioned some of it. We met on uh, Paul Rosendez, Ackles Discord. Um, I learned soldering at the beginning of 2020. It was just a pandemic and uh, I was sitting in my garage, needed something to do. I was sick of software. It's like, hey, can I do something else that's not that? I had gotten an Amiga a little while before. Um, I happened to get a 4091 on eBay. Um, and the a, a large part of the pandemic, the card was sitting actually in my mom's attic in Germany um, until I was able to finally go there and pick it up in the August of 2021. And that lines up pretty well with Amy West last year. He had the card in hand. Mm. We were encouraged here to pursue the goal of reproducing it. Mm. So that was our timeline. You'll see the timeline stops in April 2022. Uh, That's when we started our mass production of the board. So we did a lot of debugging along the way. Since April, we have done more debugging, and then we have done more debugging, and we have fixed a number of amazing bugs. So one of those things was that we now do like several days of testing on each card to make sure that it is rock solid. Um, I would go as, fast, as far as saying that our cards are now more stable than the original, um, particularly also with some of the software work we've done. Um. I, I'd agree with that. And I'd also, I, I think some of you have heard the phrase before, the first 10% or the first 90% takes 10% of the time. The last 10% takes the 90% of the time. And we were in that phase for the last several months that's of April. That's the stuff where you're falling off the cliff over here, yeah. <laughs> um. Right. And so why are we doing this? It's like, heck, it's 2022, really a SCSI controller, like who uses SCSI anymore? Why is Zorro 3, right? So you guys all know this, like I don't have to explain this. So, like, prices of Amigas have skyrocketed, it's uh, crazy. I know like uh, one guy here um, just this year bought one of these cards on eBay for like over $500. So we are like, hey, that's not what we think of uh, like an accessible hobby anymore, right? Like uh, it's getting pretty exclusive and how do you solve this? Um, we work on on making the stuff available so that people can learn from it and, and enjoy it the, the way we think it should be done. Um, and I want to point out, like, um, we were definitely inspired by folks like Paul Rezendez and John Hertel, who have done the re Amiga projects and rebuilt the Amiga 4000 and, and all the other Amigas. Um, and of course, it was uh, Dave Haney released the Dave Haney files. And so, Dave Haney files actually include the logic source code to the logic that is included on the Amiga 4091. That was one of the key pieces that went into making this project possible. So thank you, Dave. Um, and it, 
we wanted it to be accessible, right? But also compatible. Like you can find any modern solution probably if you design anything from scratch. You can find something with uh, like a, a compact flash card or an SD card and it will be easy and fast and cheap, but it's not the same feeling as what we had before. And there goes the slides. Um, <laughs> Is it going to uh, come back? The screen saved us. All right. OK. <laughs> it's not back here yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I also think like open source, like we want to make this stuff available, right? Because we, we spend our youth like playing with this stuff, growing up with this stuff, learning about technology. And I think that it is a good way of learning about technology. Nowadays, stuff has gotten so complicated that like you cannot easily get to the same level of depth that you could like 20 or 30 years ago. And so this is like a great example of how you, how you can learn about hardware and get your hands dirty. And um, it's a super fun project. And just to add what uh, Stefan uh, mentioned earlier, you know, we both have a background in firmware. So coming into something that is different than our professional experience, that's, that's new and interesting. That's, that's something that's exciting to move into. Um, I, I know of a lot of hardware people who also dabble in software and try to head in that direction as well. And that, that's, that's a hobby thing for those hardware people. And so I, I really l enjoy doing this as a hobby. I don't think I'd enjoy doing it professionally, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah, I, we definitely, Chris and I, we definitely talked each other into this project. Um, and well, last but not least, I want to point out, like this is our attempt of a little tribute to standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like the amazing people that have built the Amiga. Um, we, we have not invented this stuff. We have not built it, but we want to contribute our, our little part in making future generations, like be able to learn from it. Ooh, there's a window. Badly formatted number. All right. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, part of why this project was fun was we wanted to build something end to end, right? So we started out redrawing the schematics. We did the PCB layout. We went on and once we had this giant PCB that was wobbling around in the Amiga 3000 and 4000, it's like this thing is gonna break if we don't mount it somehow, right? So we made, we had help getting brackets made actually um, and once you have the brackets now it starts looking like a product so heck product needs boxes manuals discs maybe needs new drivers right so we really try to like start with one thing and then go to to see how far we can do everything that was involved and and also understand the whole process um, so it started out and I'm going to speed up a little bit now because we have a lot of slides and there's uh, not a whole lot of time. <laughs> um, we started taking a bunch of pics um, of the original card to analyze it. Right? Um, there's a URL down there. You can look at what we did. And then we started mapping um, all the connections um, and like basically sitting with a multimeter and measuring every pin to every other pin on the board. Uh, you see me measuring there, Chris is noting it down in a spreadsheet. Uh, that's how it all began. And then we were like, yeah, but we don't really know what's going on there, like uh, what's happening under the chip. So we took some chips down. We started, I socketed the chips on the first board that we had. Um, and I think another reason for removing the chips is we were trying to create artwork that was identical to the original board. You know, we could have gone our own way with the routing on these boards to maybe because the tools today are, are much more advanced than what they had available in the early 90s. We could have done a much better job on the routing of this board than what Commodore was capable of doing back in the early 90s. But really, what we wanted to do was produce a board that was identical to the original Commodore board because that's really what we want to show is we're giving credit to where mm. uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. I think Seven said earlier, and that's that's the way to. We were we were really, really looking for that. Yeah. So this is um, some intermediate work where Chris started then routing, and he did an amazing job actually placing all the um, traces where they were on the original board, 
and we learned a couple of interesting things actually like the revision a of the board had a bunch of botch wires like across the board right on revision b that was later uh, manufactured by dkb um, those bodge wires were on the inner layers of the board um, quite elegantly. Now, how do you analyze where those bodge wire, where those traces were going without actually destroying the board? Um, turns out I took a flashlight, a pretty strong flashlight, held the card against the light, and that way you could actually see some of the traces here and how the and it doesn't come out super well on the picture, but it was good enough to determine all of the inner layers of the board without ever destroying the card. Because we also were not sure if once we're done routing and, and building the thing, what if it doesn't work? If we destroy the original, we'll never be able to get it work because we have nothing to compare against, right? So this was like our one golden um, original that we had. Now to say something in addition to that, we, we had already with a meter, traced out every point, every point on the board, so we knew what was connected to what on the board. Looking at those in, insert inside layers, we had an idea what connected to what on the inside, but we didn't know the path that it took. So this was not only confirming what we measured with the, the meter, but we also wanted to match the actual routing that they used inside the layers of the board. Oh, and. One thing Chris insisted on that's a little different from the original, actually, <laughs> is clear labeling for easy building. <laughs> so that when you have the board in front of you and you assemble it, you know what size capacitor or what bead goes on where. And uh, this was later on turned out to be super helpful for us. Yeah, here's a, a large picture of the board. Once we were done, this is like a, a fun detail about the board is the uh, active terminator, active SCSI terminator is part of the design. Um, and you see this as a cutout in the original board. And that's also what we did. We fabricated it like that and then we dremeled out the, the little terminator and built it separately. Now in all the uh, photos that we saw online of that SCSI terminator, they were never inside the board anymore because of course Commodore removed that before they shipped it. Mm. So we did a little bit of imagination on that, you know, how it was mounted to the board and such, and we, we took a look at the board that Stefan had, and we didn't have a Terminator with that board, correct? Yeah. It didn't come with a Terminator. But uh, we had a pretty good idea where they, they attached the SCSI Terminator in the center. It's a good time to like say thank you to a number of people here, right? Because. Um, like while we spent, both of us spent a lot of time on this project, of course we didn't do this alone, right? So first of all, Dave Haney um, did the original hardware design and opened the files that went into the logic of the board. Um, that was, without that, this wouldn't have never happened. Um, Simon Goss uh, helped us with the uh, metal brackets. Um, and I had long evenings of discussions with him. He is over in the UK. And he tried to talk me out of that elegant double bend that the metal bracket has. That's a pain uh, to to do. Um, and he did an extra shift to actually help us out and, and make those. Uh, Tim here, he is in Australia. And um, when we made the manual for this thing, I was looking for an original copy of the manual. And there was none to be found, right? So I wrote to everybody on Amibay that had ever bought a card in the last 10 years. It's like, do you still have the manual? And if so, can you scan it for me? Three months, nobody answered, right? And after three months, Tim came around and said, hey, are you still looking? I, I know it's like long time ago. And I said, please send this to me. And so he did. Um, uh, Mike Batilana helped us out with the uh, um, licenses for the ROM sticker, for the, for the ROMs that um, we're shipping with us now we went a, a, a dual sided uh, strategy there we also uh, did rewrite the original driver um, and then uh, as an open source driver basically and so you can choose do you want the original driver or do you want the new one the new one has a bunch of new features but if you want to go original now you can um, Olaf Bartle and Tony Wyon both while we were writing the drivers, uh, and we started asking questions, stupid questions in the Amiga forums. They were like telling us, just like, it sounds really interesting what you guys are doing. Like, if you want us to help, like, let's let's talk. And so 
we had a couple of good, um, lots of good information and couple of very interesting anecdotes uh, from both of them. That was really helpful to actually get this I done. Agree. Correct. Uh, yeah. All right. So you, you, you covered the first part. Yeah. Um, so the brackets, we got, um, we got the PCB done. Then the PCB was not very stable in the machine. We tried to figure out what's going on. This was our first approach. So hey, let's 3D print it. Done, right? But it's not very stable, and it, it doesn't hold very well. It's also a non-standard part. And so Simon, as I mentioned, um, he's, he's excellent in metal work. So he did um, this laser cutting for us and the bends. And so he sent us uh, a whole box full of these. And uh, you know these these brackets came back looking just beautiful from him. Uh, along the way, while uh, we were still discussing with him the possibility of building brackets, I also took a crack at building a bracket. And as you can see, the bend is not so great. Bending metal is actually hard. Bending metal and making it look good is hard. M you know, just bending metal is easy. Bending it and making it look good is hard. Um, so we decided not to go that route. Simon was a much better uh, person for handling the metal parts. Uh, but when we receive them, it's cut metal, and it's been bent. But it's not metal that won't rust, needs some protection, it needs some isolation from the board. The original 4091 and the 2091 as well have a layer of clear vinyl between the metal of the bracket and the board. And so we decided to go ahead and do the same thing as what Commodore had done, but we took it one step further. So we we applied clear vinyl on one side of the board, and all the rest of the metal we coated with a, a clear, uh, it's like a polyurethane seal. So they're protected against rust, fingerprints, that sort of thing. So what you see here are actually the boards laying out on a, on a bench after being sprayed. All Our right. Work. So a little further on this. Uh, and I'm going to speed up some more because we're running out of time here. Um, the artwork, we had never seen the box uh, other than some pictures uh, online. And so we knew how, how big the board was, but we didn't know how big the box was. So we did some math here and extrapolated. Um, this was the manual as we had known it before. Um, so we, we redid the manual based on some old artwork that we had and, and the scans. Um, original manual was in three languages. We cut two of them out just to make it easier and, and more uh, better to handle and cheaper. Okay. Um, of course, you need a box, right? Um, so we, we did the box. It's a pretty big... Um, a, a pretty big bunch of uh, cardboard that was sent to me after we got it printed. Um, and so we started folding them together. There you see like my office room um, with all of the boxes. But then within the box there should be some, some foam. So I got some foam. This is actually pretty fun. Uh, I got it on AliExpress and you have to dump it into the shower uh, and spray it because it, it's very compressed in the beginning, right? You make it wet and it starts growing and then you have to hang it up and dry it and then you cut it and then you have to get the cat back out of it again because the cat loves it. And then clean it off the cat hair. So getting ready for the bringer, we got the boards. Um, and they look pretty awesome here. Um, we assembled it. First one took about a day for me to assemble. And then Chris and I were sitting together and we turned it on in the evening and it showed up in the boot menu. And it's like, amazing, we got it done, right? We're let's going home. Let's <laughs> stop here. We go home, we do it together uh, again tomorrow, right? Next day he came over again and the thing doesn't work. It's like, what the heck is going on, right? Um, so. Turns out every second boot, or on the first boot it shows up, every other boot it does not show up anymore. Um, so time to debug this stuff. 
So we, we independently, we spent a lot of time with an analyzer, each of us, trying to figure out what's going on in the bus. Why is it there? Why is it not there sometimes? We're, we're going fast through the slides now. Yeah. <laughs> Do you uh, want to talk so about the yeah, assumptions? So, yeah. um, so a couple of assumptions we made along the way are uh, commodore use certain uh, gals and uh, PAL CE parts in different positions on the board. And these are programmable logic that are used to configure, oh, we lost the screen again, the programming logic that are used to configure how the, how the board interacts with signals on the bus. And they used a particular combination of speeds and also types of parts. Well, these days, you can't get exactly parts from the same batch or exactly the same speeds as what were used back then. So we improvised, we thought, eh, it should, should be no problem to use something that's newer and faster and all the way better and, well, we learned a valuable lesson. That's, that's not always, newer is not always better. Mm. Along with the uh, ferrite beads, that was another thing. Uh, sorry, we're a little ahead on this. Uh, ferrite beads on the board, Commodore on the, 40, on the 4000T used certain ferrite beads we assumed that they had also used on the 4091 because, remember, they didn't publish any schematics or any information on the 4091. So we kind of went, well, maybe they used these same 600 ohm beads on the 4091. It turns out, no, it wasn't 600 ohms at all. So we did some measurement. Uh, I think that we removed that slide. Uh, yeah. Actually, if you want to find out more about this, you can see Stefan's talk from the VSF East, VCF East, that he gave. So let's, let's move on from there. Yeah. I think, I think you're up there. All right. So we, we, well. we finally figured out the combination of stuff that works. And success. Yeah, so we got um, here also the same performance as the original board per default. Um, it's about 5.1 megabytes per second. It's quite a bit slower than the actual maximum of the SCSI bus, but it's also much faster than like the onboard um, uh, Amiga 3000 or 4000 uh, storage controllers, right? And depending, there's a bunch of things you can do to get the speed up, including overclocking the board and uh, uh, we're still also working on, on some of this. So I mentioned the gals earlier. Um, we, of course, needed a way to program them. And along the way, Stefan developed a small uh, board that would allow us to better connect our analyzer up to it. That's what he's got there. Terminator. Yeah, so here you see like how we're dremeling out the Terminator. Um, and it's, it made me sweat quite a bit, actually, cutting around with a Dremel on the, these boards that we had just bought. And um, it makes also quite a mess when you're cutting this stuff out. So there's no, no perfect solution for this, I guess. Like, I was hoping it'd be as easy as breaking it out, but oh no. Like, if you want it to look nice, you got to get out the, the big tools. Here's, uh, yeah, we did. Um, also reverse the uh, disc labels and the disc. Um, the disc was, yeah, I would say the, the hardest part to find because we had one only very like low resolution photo of the disc. And we decided in the end to take some artistic freedom. Um, most other discs from the era had this uh, 3.1 um, artwork on it. Um, and so does the manual, um, the original manual of the 4091, but not the disc. We added it here because Chris went through lengths to actually produce the reproduce the artwork, and so it's there. It's not exact copy of the original, but it's uh, getting pretty close. So, along with the controller in the box, Commodore also included some other accessories, uh, such as a SCSI cable, um, power cable, and also a LED cable. So. Uh, mostly, we acquired these through AliExpress or eBay. Uh, we'll be including those in the, the packaging of the, the product. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to mention is uh, Commodore's power cable was just a power cable for a drive that attaches to the board. And we thought these days, you know, a lot of people are using products like SCSI 2SD or SCSI 2SD that uh, have a uh, floppy power connector. So why not have a cable that has both? Well, I, I found a vendor on AliExpress that was willing to make custom cables for us. And 
So now we have a cable that has both the large Molex and also the, the small bird connector. Right on. And this is uh, a photo from our little factory here. And this oh. is the Rev2 board now. This is the Rev2 board. It's a black board that we made. I, we actually have the boards. If you want to come by later and you haven't seen it yet, please stop by and, and uh, uh, look at this stuff. Here's Chris uh, with a microscope and uh, the heat plate, uh, the car in the back, all of our parts gathered. Um, there's me uh, trying to put more stuff on the boards. <sighs> yeah, and let's talk a little bit about the, the software of the whole thing. Um, software, um, the original latest version released was uh, 40.13 by Commodore, right? 40.20 was spotted somewhere in the wild, but yeah, whatever. Um, Cosmos Amiga published a, a patch 40.14 um, that fixes some of the bugs, um, and but it it's all pretty limited, right? There's no real development that it's, uh, is possible on these old drivers because the, the source code is not really available and uh, the the legal situation is a little bit unclear, and so we um, the uh, uh, driver basically was also limited in feature set. It didn't support NSD, it didn't support uh, TD64. So with direct SCSI um, on uh, 3.2, you can use the, uh, hard drives with the old dr uh, driver that are larger than four gigs. Um, but uh, it needs a little bit of a workaround there, um, which is a shame because the Amiga 4000T shares almost the same driver minus like the Zorro 3 detection part. Um, but yet the driver cannot be used on the uh, 4091. Um, so what, we d what did we do? Um, my approach to things is often like if it's not open source, it's a waste of time, especially if it's a hobby, right? Like it's, this is not a business. We want to have people look at this and learn from it. And so Chris started rewriting uh, the driver based on NetBSD code that was supporting the chip. Um, and uh, what you do is uh, use a much more modern and modular driver design. Um, it uses an um, open source uh, NCR script compiler. So the NCR chip itself is actually has a little microcontroller in it that runs its own programs. And um, so we could reuse a lot of this uh, from uh, the original NetBSD driver. And um, turns out, like, um, with a Zoro 3 RAM card in the system, we were able to, with our own driver now, measure over 7 megabytes per second on this board, uh, which is, is pretty fantastic, actually. Of course, it uh, supports NSD and TD64, so large hard drives. And you get a, a pre-boot diagnostic screen, and you get CD-ROM booting. So I'm not going to say too much to this slide other than uh, Stefan mentioned TD64 and NSD. So back when Commodore did the 4013 driver, that's the, the version of the driver for the 4091. They didn't have support for 4 gig in any of the driver interfaces at that point, anything above 4 gig drives. So there are a lot of no's here because of that, because a lot of these are answering the 64-bit. The it's either TD64, which is one standard, or NSD is the other standard for 64-bit access. Really, it's two standards that are almost identical in, in how they're implemented. So it's trivial to do both, but there really didn't need to be two standards. And this 47.4 column, this is Commodore's current driver, what they're, uh, not Commodore, Hyperion's current driver, what they're shipping with 3.2.1, as far as the yeses go. So we support a few more packet types, but really, if you think about the stack of, of I.O. in an Amiga. You've got at the littlest layer, you've got hardware. Above that, you've got a device driver. Above that, you have a handler, file system, whatever you want to call it, a library. And then above that, you have DOS, and then you have your application. So we're writing the driver. It's a layer right above the hardware. And really, to do I.O., you really only need read to work and write to work, and maybe a few ancillary functions to tell you whether a drive's been removed or not for CD-ROMs, that sort of thing. So all these yeses and nos doesn't, don't really matter other than the fact that if you can get I.O. through the device, that's all that really matters. 
I want to point out though that the cool thing about this is, right, that now there is also a, a public documentation more or less on how to implement a driver that has all of these features. Um, Good point. Yeah, we will be open sourcing the entire thing by the end of the month, so all the source code will be out there. Yeah, we, we went through a lot of, of challenges on the software side and a part of uh, it's just like I tried to get CD-ROM boot to work and it just wouldn't work and I had no idea. I looked at whatever driver stuff I could find on the internet and I tried to implement it in a, in a similar way in spirit. I could not get it to work. Um, so um, the, the driver details, sometimes they're a little poorly documented, right? Which is why or the reader did not comprehend the documentation. Like I don't want to cast blame here, but um, definitely um, uh, trying to like create something that people can look at and say like, ah, this is how it's working in practice and in a, in a comprehensive manner, right? Um, so we, we did rely on a, a lot of anecdotes and tribal knowledge and people saying to us like, hey, did you try this? Hey, look over there, like go read this part of the documentation. Um, while we were developing, we found a GCC bug in the Bebo's uh, Amiga GCC that got fixed. Um, we found out that um, uh, F-base rel in GCC is a mess and has a lot of interesting side effects. Um, one thing that I personally found curious is the uh, rigid disk lock parsing is not part of the operating system. It's part of the storage driver. So every storage driver needs to parse the partition table by itself. And so this leads to every driver doing a slightly different thing there, um, which also leads to interesting effects. Um, but uh, I so this led to basically me looking at four or five different variants of the same thing, and none of them. Um, and so loading hunks, loading hunk binaries at boot time doesn't work because you cannot use DOS. So we wrote our own. I basically wrote my own load stack implementation here. Um, which was a, a good experience to practice my 68K assembly again. Um, and then there was this thing at the end where like, how do we separate the partition parsing from the rest of the driver? You open the device and it doesn't open because you're still in the device. The device doesn't exist. So how do you talk to the device driver from within the device driver? That was a little bit challenging for us. So we uh, had some hardware challenges along the way, sourcing parts. You go next. Okay. Um, these are all identical parts we bought in the same batch off of eBay. Oops, they're not identical. Look at the bottom side of them. They're all different. So often when you buy from vendors on eBay, especially in China, they'll resurface the parts. They'll make them all look brand new on the top side. But they come from different batches, removed from different boards and such, and they're not the same. Another hardware challenge. Sometimes when you're mounting 228 components on a board, you make a mistake, and especially when you're doing it by hand. So arrow pointing there, that should have been a capacitor. Was quick to fix once we realized what went wrong. Now it's a capacitor. Boom. Uh, another hardware challenge along the way when you're surface mount soldering and you're using hot air, sometimes when you surface mount and heat one side of the chip uh, unevenly from the other side, that side will stick down. And when you get around to the other side, the other side is up in the air. And it doesn't actually, the pins don't actually touch the surface of the board anymore. Sometimes you end up with bridges. Sometimes you end up with just one pin because it got bent before it went on the board. That's floating. It's kind of hard to see the floating there. It's kind of a little bit blurry. And sometimes you just forget to put solder paste under a component, such as our capacitor there. So it's amazing the board worked as long as it did before we discovered, hey, there's no solder under this component. So those are some of the har harder challenges we experienced along the way in, in building both the Rev1 and the Rev2. All right, so to wrap this up, um, here are some quick glimpse on the work we've been doing on the driver side, right? Like we added a boot menu. Um, the early start menu, you can probe for your disks, you can check out your dip switches, what they're set to without climbing behind your Amiga. Um, 
and um, one of the features we had is uh, implementing CD-ROM booting. So you put in an Amiga OS 3.2 CD, you can boot off directly off the CD without adding a floppy disk to the mix. Um, this is going to make reinstalling your Amiga a lot easier in the future. So where is it? Well, let me tell you, the cards are right over there. Come by, talk to us, um, and um, look at the thing. I'm really sorry, uh, Alex, like I'm stealing all of your time here. So I'm going to hurry up now. Um, this is our last slide, I promise. Please <laughs> come over um, and talk to us later. Um, we have a lot more stuff to talk about and a lot more stuff to show. It's a really cool project. Um, and what's next is for us, we want to get this thing out of there, right? Like, get people to use it. Um, we want to open source the schematics and the Gerber files. Um, we are looking towards uh, people to help us build these because we have now built uh, 30 of them together. and. It's not a sustainable, a sustainable hobby in uh, a garage for uh, keep building these for the next year or two, <laughs> and then so um, somebody else needs to like take it from there and, and do shipping, and like so we're talking to folks for that. Well, hopefully, somebody will will step up and help us, and we kind of need a break from the project and build some other easy stuff that somebody else built and put in our Amigas and tested with a 4091. Um, and that's it. So please, yeah, wait for the open source release soon, and, and hopefully um, you'll stop by and, and check out the cards in person. Thank you, everyone. And that's it. Okay.